And I'd like to welcome everyone to NTW22 and to thank all the supporters, professional bodies and sponsoring organisations who have helped to make this conference possible. This afternoon, we have a panel of amazing VT champions, but this session is also about the audience, you. And I hope you brought plenty of questions with you because the next hour is a great chance to ask the panel of these amazing VT leads all about challenges and issues. Please simply use your Q&A button to submit your question and comments. So the chair today is Professor Rupin Ara. Uh, Rupin is a clinical director for haematology at King's College London and director of the King's Thrombosis Centre and lead thrombosis and haemostasis at King's College Hospital. He's the clinical lead for the National VT Prevention Programme at NHS England and as director of the National VT Exemplar Centres Network has overseen the establishment of more than 35 VT Exemplar Centres, which is amazing. So without a further delay, let me pass over to our chair, Professor Rupanera. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Joe, for your kind words and welcome everyone to this uh, second uh, session of National Thrombosis Week. And thank you particularly to Thrombosis UK and Joe as the CEO uh, who has really done a fantastic job with uh, you know, in the long term with Thrombosis UK, but in this particular week, making one week stretch out into two weeks because there's so much to cover. So we have a fabulous panel today and uh, uh, I see many friends and colleagues also among the participants uh, already. So just a brief intro for the panel. So Dr. Dr. Lara Roberts, uh, is a consultant colleague uh, at King's and VT lead at King's College Hospital. And she's played, I think, a very important role nationally, uh, both in driving the root cause analysis of HATS at King's and nationally, as well as in the design uh, uh, of the NHS GERP thrombosis survey and also in the writing of the report. So welcome, Lara. And Emma G, again, is a colleague at King's nurse consultant in thrombosis and uh, coagulation. And again, she has worked uh, both in the UK and Australia. And she joined our team at King's many years ago and is lead for the National Nursing and Midwifery Network in NMN. Then we have Catherine Sterling who's a consultant pharmacist for anticoagulation and thrombosis at Leeds Teaching Hospitals with a very important role covering all areas of thrombosis and anticoagulation. And she is uh, part of the Trust Thrombosis Steering Group and multidisciplinary team for VT. And last but not least is uh, Hugh Rouswell, who is a consultant nurse in thrombosis at Plymouth and is vice chair of clinical leaders of thrombosis and a trustee of BSH. He is his hospital VT lead and chair of the thrombosis committee. And you played a central role in Plymouth being named one of the very early exemplar centers soon after King's uh, quite a few years ago now. So it's a very knowledgeable and experienced panel. So we can open up to uh, questions, uh, okay. So let's start, uh, there's a question around VT prevention, CNSs. So what tool or tools can I best employ to improve risk assessment compliance as a VT prevention CNS? Who wants to take that? You, uh, shall we get started with you? Um, yeah, I guess I guess we were lucky because when we started all of this, we had the sequin, so we had the money behind it, and then subsequently the financial penalty, which, which have all kind of paused now. As I know we're still not having to send any kind of reports back, so we're still ninety-five percent is still not nationally mandated. I know we've talked about this, how 
whilst we're still achieving that, but certainly is not the case nationally. I think that the important thing is that it's looking at how you reduce harm, isn't it? The big thing that we talk about is that by using risk assessment, we can demonstrate that we've improved outcome, we've reduced patient harm um, and reduced litigation because ultimately if patients aren't being risk assessed, not receiving appropriate prophylaxis, that there, there is a consequence to those actions. But it, it, I appreciate it is, it's much more difficult. We were, we were very fortunate. We had all these national drivers right at the beginning. And I think we, it's now so embedded, it, it was a lot easier to do then. Emma, uh, anything to add? You know, uh, uh, how uh, to improve the compliance with the risk assessment, you know, given that uh, VTA prevention is jostling with so many other patient safety priorities within the trust system. It, uh, it is washing and now COVID in quite a big way. So yeah, it, yeah, it is. It, it is challenging. Um, I think sort of following on from what Hugh said, um, the importance of data and sharing data throughout your hospital and bringing thrombosis to life for people so that it isn't just about a risk assessment, but people are actually thinking about the consequences of having a VTE. So, um, you know, the worst outcome being death, um, thinking about recurrent VTEs in future, post-thrombotic syndrome, um, CTEF, just so that people understand it isn't just a tick box exercise. They've got to think about the repercussions. And in a practical sense, I think you, one of the most important tools that we use here at King's was employing a VTE link network. Um, and by employing, I just mean mobilizing. We didn't pay them, unfortunately, extra for this role. Um, but it was really vital. We're a big trust, um, as many of our hospitals are now throughout England. And um, it would be impossible for one VTE CNS to reach every clinical area and find out the little nuances of how things worked there, uh, overcome any barriers. So it was essential that we had eyes and ears on the ground it takes quite a lot of investment in terms of time and resources to look after and nurture the link network. But I think what you put in, you definitely get out in that they can identify what's going wrong much more quickly than we might be able to do ourselves. And then we can work with them to remedy that. So I think that's a really good tool alongside um, using your data and working with your um, business units to make sure that you have really good up-to-date risk assessment data that you can then disseminate back on a regular basis to the clinical areas. Thanks, uh, Emma. So really risk assessment has uh, is the trigger for prophylaxis and has been the focus of our attention now for the past uh, what, 10, 12 years, since 2010, when we went live uh, with the risk assessment tool. So maybe I'll take this opportunity to ask the question of where we go from here, because uh, uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware that uh, due to COVID, uh, uh, NHS Dig Digital has temporarily put the national collection of risk assessment data on pause uh, and is reviewing what it wants to do. You know, I mean, the options clearly would be to continue with the monthly unified to kind of data collection as we've been doing because it's a very important driver. The other alternative also being discussed is maybe changing to uh, some kind of quarterly uh, system of looking at risk assessment uh, using sampling rather than submitting uh, the data on all the inpatients. So uh, does the panel have a, a view about where we should be going with this? I mean, uh, has the collection of risk assessment data for all the adult inpatients had its day, or is it still useful? Maybe I'll ask Catherine that difficult question. Thank you, uh, coming to me first. Um, 
I think we still have been at least collecting the data. I think probably like many places, we've got some sort of electronic form of data collection because of electronic patient records or whether it's done through your electronic prescribing systems. Um, and as shown in the, the GERF study, there are a lot of areas still not reaching that. So we are, as we know, putting patients still at harm from, from that. It would seem... It would seem a shame to, to go back on, on the good work that's already been built in, I think, from, from those uh, regular risk assessments um, and recording those and to, to lose all the, the work that we've done around, around that in preventing inpatient harm and the reduction in, in deaths due to hospital-associated VTEs. Um, it's important. <laughs> I think obviously it does depend on trust systems and it's a shame that we haven't got, you know, some more easy national IT ways of collecting some of this data. We used to have to people walking around the wards looking at forms back in the day. Um, now it is done electronically and we could, can pull it off from a system, but it's still, you know, it, um, obviously it's still time consuming, isn't it, for those teams to do it. But I do think personally, I think it's still really important that we are having some way of collecting that. I think it's difficult to get teams sometimes with lots of other competing priorities as Emma talked about to to you know feel that everything is as important if it's not you know if it's just, just you know do it if you remember or just looking at a cross section because I think it will slip off that list of of things that we need to check with our patients um and we know that we still are causing harms from uh, from from VTE so I think I would be in favor of continuing what we're what we're doing I think um just also thinking about the last question as well. I mean, obviously um, thinking about things like alerts or um, around making sure that forms are done. It was very helpful in our trust, something we implemented with the junior medics so that it was something that they, they had uh, ownership over how we reminded them to do you know, VTE risk assessments as well. It's really, really important and getting them involved to help with that and to see the importance of when a patient, you know, does risk assessment, we put something in place as a patient that hasn't and feeding back on those uh, when they have had a VTE. So, yeah, I think we should continue. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, and uh, it was interesting to me to hear at a recent meeting of the Nursing and Midwifery Network that... Uh, some centers are still collecting this data on paper. So, you know, it's not without its burden. Lara, do you have a view? Should we carry on uh, with the data collection and why? And if so, why? Yeah. I'm inclined to agree with Catherine. I think for those where there are electronic systems in place um, and we're fairly easily able to collect the data in a census way, I think that should continue. Um, I do acknowledge for patients that don't have electronic solution, uh, centres that don't have electronic solutions, it probably is an unfair burden of work and perhaps there needs to be a two-tier process where those centres can do such purposeful sampling. Um, but I think in a way it's the easiest thing to collect electronically because if you want to look at the quality standards and look at whether thromboprophylaxis was appropriately prescribed within 14 hours. That needs some clinical cross-checking. You can't just pull out prescriptions because you can't know whether it was appropriate or not. So, so for large scale data, I think the risk assessment is the more attractive um, audit. Thanks. Yeah, there's a comment from Dr. Saravanan that electronic prescribing does help. It's great for the initial assessment but it doesn't give a reminder for 24 hours and when the patient condition changes. So I think again, that is something that has come out of the surveys in that we remain bad at uh, the repeat risk assessment. So how are we gonna go about improving that, do you think? Lara, since you're on screen, um, so I guess the, the approach we've taken here has been sort of individualized to the area. Um, so for medicine, for example, where they often at risk assessment don't have all the information they need to fully assess bleeding risk where they're waiting for a CT head or something else. They now on day two use an electronic ward view, which tells them how many risk assessments they've had, what the risk assessment outcome was, and whether they're on prophylaxis 
as, as a dry or a trigger to reassess those who had a high bleeding risk to see whether that's still the case and if not to, to reassess and to um, prescribe. And we are working on an electronic prompt with EPR to support that. Um, I know Hugh in, in the early days did a lot of work with his neurosurgical department about reassessment. So he might want to elaborate on the solutions um, that they employed there. Yeah, thanks, Lara. Do you want to come in, Hugh, on that? Yeah, I mean, neurosurgery obviously is a very specific example because clearly when they arrive, most patients there have a quite a big bleeding risk. So and often it's mechanical prophylaxis. What the problem was, they were never being reassessed. They were ending up with VTEs going from nothing to full dose. So actually, they, have, they are now much better in, in that department of reassessment and acknowledging that when the risks reduce. So neurosurgery in some ways is an easier one to do because they, they all mostly started with nothing. So there was, it was quite clear we could improve things. I would agree in other, other disciplines, probably not so well. We still see it's not done brilliantly reassessment, particularly we tried to, when we do an electronic prescribing, what we tried to introduce was if patients moved ward, in medical patients, i.e. left the medical admissions ward, they should be reassessed because things have changed. The patients that stayed there probably didn't need one. And with mixed success, I, I'll be honest, it had some effect, but it's still an area that it needs more work. And I think it's, it's never been as successful as the first assessment where, where all the focus was initially put upon. Yeah, no, I, I think it's very important we get it right because uh, it comes up in the cases of uh, hospital associated thrombosis quite frequently, you know, that uh, uh, people didn't clock that, you know, the bleeding risk has diminished and it was time to start pharmacological prophylaxis. And unfortunately, the patient has suffered as a consequence. We have uh, over 130 participants and uh, I cannot believe that uh, there are not questions they want to ask, but otherwise they'll get to hear what we think they need to hear, <laughs> Good to see the panel. So I think uh, another uh, question that we get quite frequently in the National Nursing and Midwifery Network is, uh, how do you go about establishing a VT prevention post? Because I think GERFT, uh, the GERFT survey highlighted that there were many hospitals uh, that did not have a dedicated VT prevention post. Emma, do you want to take that? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Rupin. The GERF survey showed that um, about a third of the trusts that participated didn't have a dedicated VT practitioner, whether that be full time or part time, um, which may be appropriate for it to be part time um, in smaller trusts. And um, I think this is quite challenging and we do get contacted fairly regularly from centres wishing to um, argue their case for a dedicated practitioner. Um, because of that, we have written a template business case and put that on the vtengland.org.uk website under the resources page. And that sets out your arguments that you can use. So things um, such as the 21% reduction in, in post-discharge PE deaths is very, very strong. And also the, um, the, the sort of achievements and accomplishments of the VTE prevention program so far. Um, I think what was really interesting was that during COVID, when some centres had to pull their VTE nurses into critical care or, or other clinical roles. Uh, I had a lot of people saying that once they then went back into their roles, things had slipped. Obviously, there were an awful lot of variables there. There was a lot going on, um, you know, that was uh, outside our standard practice. But we have seen time and time again where centres do have VT practitioners and then lose them subsequently. The standards do seem to slip. Even though um, we're aiming for embedded practice, we know that there does need to be a level of surveillance and um, and uh, the teaching program needs to be man maintained. There needs to be a contact person in place. Thanks, Lara. I think Lara's just put up the link that you can click on to go to that business case. Um, so I think it's about arguing your case locally and um, making the powers but that be the management see how vital and important it is and like I say don't forget it may well be that this um, can be done part-time and it partners quite nicely sometimes with an anticoagulation role sometimes people working in patient safety or risk management have um, used part of their time to dedicate towards VT prevention as well which works quite nicely.
Super, Emma. I think uh, that role is absolutely vital, I think, in uh, successful delivery of VT prevention. So I think uh, combining the VT prevention, uh, CNS, or you know, it can be other healthcare professionals, uh, together with uh, VT champions on the wards, I think, uh, is what works. And uh, ensuring the pharmacists are also uh, monitoring the risk assessment, particularly, and the delivery of appropriate prophylaxis. I think uh, there's uh, a couple of questions. One is, uh, again, Dr. Sarvanan on uh, incorporating VT assessments and uh, importance of patient safety in uh, foundation year teaching soon after induction is one of the things they've tried. And uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, education, education, education has certainly uh, uh, been the kind of bedrock of our efforts uh, uh, over the years. Uh, so does uh, you know, Catherine, do you want to comment on the kind of teaching? Because certainly I think for us, teaching around VTE, prevention as well as safe anticoagulation is something that we've invested in very heavily and is you know absolutely critical for patient safety because things continue to go wrong. Catherine, any comments on you know the, the role of pharmacists, nurses in education? Yeah, thank you. I, I agree with the, the comments about um, getting in early in terms of patient safety with the, the foundation you're teaching and, and the teaching of all sort of new healthcare professionals as they come uh, into the into the area. We've definitely found we've had better um, so it's improved risk, um, risk assessment rates um, and better education when we've also got some junior doctors, pharmacists that are also keen and want to either go and discuss more things with their own areas. So maybe taking back some of the events that have happened or the learning from hospital associated VTEs as well. Um, and we've definitely felt the hit with doing everything online, actually. It's it's just, it, it's great that we can do all this together today for an hour and I'm in Leeds and you're around the country, but actually that face-to-face -face approach to teaching um, with the junior doctors and as, as, yeah, I feel like we're missing something when we are on teams and we can't see their faces, they can just see us. <laughs> um, it's been harder to get as good engagement there. So um, I completely agree and use it. We use our sort of local pharmacists or ward pharmacists or, or you know, area-based pharmacists. They do a lot of um, sort of teaching around anticoagulation and safety and, and envelop VTE for sort of local groups that um, as, as uh, doctors rotate through the area. And obviously we need to remember a uh, advanced clinical and, and nurse and practitioners as well as they're doing a lot more prescribing and often doing the risk assessment. And sometimes they haven't had that uh, exposure that maybe the junior doctors have so making sure we're getting all groups really for for that education and trying to to link in where possible producing learning we've done from um when we have had vt uh, hospital associated uh, vt events maybe that have been potentially preventable um and also with uh, our VT prevention nurse specialist Louise puts lots of things together on World Thrombosis Day so that we can link everything in and, and sort of cover topics on there as well that people can link into and record and listen back um, as well as obviously this being incredibly important and National Thrombosis Week to to uh, to educate um, and for people to take that learning to the hospitals so yeah uh, it definitely helps. Very comprehensive uh, response and of course the other electronic modules uh, on the Health uh, Education England website, which again, I think is part of mandatory training in most of the trusts. So I think uh, there's so many conflicting uh, priorities uh, that it's important uh, that VT prevention has a suitably high profile. And uh, in, in fact, uh, Aidan Fowler, who's the National Director of Patient Safety in this morning's uh, session highlighted that it's VT prevention is a key part of the patient safety curriculum. You know, So it's, uh, I think it's important that uh, we make sure that it remains there. Okay, good. I'm just working my way through the questions. I think the next one is uh, 
uh, someone is asking about the views on mechanical thromboprophylaxis, uh, particularly in obstetrics. And uh, uh, again, it is something that did come out of the GERF survey uh, uh, that there was uh, inappropriate use of uh, mechanical prophylaxis. Emma, do you want to take that? Yeah, thank you. We have had an awful lot of um, queries about this from the National Nursing Midwifery Network. Um, it has caused a lot of confusion. And I think that this is a case actually of where um, we've, we've done so well over the years in implementing stockings. It's so ingrained that trying to stop people now from actually putting a pair of stockings on a patient when they enter the hospital has, has actually become the challenge. Um, so at King's, um, a couple of years ago, we stopped using stockings in obstetrics and medical patients because um, the NICE guidance no longer suggests that we need to do that and the data isn't there to support their efficacy. Um, we found that people felt quite liberated once they got their heads around having to not having to put stockings on people, um, particularly in critical care. Obviously, there are patients who are unable to have um, uh, chemical thromboprophylaxis because of their bleeding risk and therefore we have substituted stockings with intermittent pneumatic compression instead for those patients but again it was just very much ingrained and it took a little while for people to feel comfortable in not using stockings um, but we know through audits that we've done in the past that even with where, where they are used sometimes the correct size isn't used because it can't be found or the patient's legs aren't measured or just one leg is measured um, and also we've seen a fair bit of skin damage done by stockings. Um, now, it, we're still using them at present in surgical patients, um, so they perhaps have their place, although current research may well, um, um, you know, change that position at present. But um, actually, it's, it, I think it frees up time and also um, money as well, if you can stop using them in obstetrics and medicine. So it just needs a unified approach, I think, across the trust to implement these changes. And there needs to be somebody communicating to give people the confidence that they can stop using stockings um, and that their patients aren't going to go on necessarily to get VTE. This is something that Hugh and I have talked an awful lot about because uh, Hugh's done some similar work in Plymouth. I don't know if you want to add anything, Hugh. Yeah, it's like, I think it is partly that it's so ingrained. You're trying to make change is so difficult. Everybody argues. The one thing we also picked up when we were looking at this is that, as we know, the nice guidance says, if you've got stockings, every 24 hours, they should be taken off, legs inspected and, and hygiene. And, and it just doesn't happen. The big concern we have, people have got them. They're, they're on there for a week and never get removed. And they're still wanting them. The other problem, of course, is so much surgery now is day surgery, and there's a lot less evidence. I know there's a trial being planned. But obviously, the big trial didn't look at day surgery, excluded all day surgery, which is the problem we run into. We've had some progress in surgery, moving it, but it, it is really difficult because it, it just seems as being something that we do. So, and I think it's up to make the to get to surgery, they're already on there. So, we've kind of missed the boat, isn't it? They don't need it at all. So, it's difficult. But I think obstetrics, I haven't done much with, to be honest, but. I know one of the talks went to this week from St. Thomas's. They sound like they were, they were basically going down from July, I think, IPPC only, and virtually no stockings anywhere is, is what they're planning to do. It's interesting to see what effect that has. So I'm interested to catch up with them to see how that goes. Because that's, a, that's a very different departure than certainly what we're planning. Yeah, I think the evidence around mechanical measures uh, is with time increasingly diminishing, isn't it? But then uh, I think uh, there are some cases like uh, there's one that has been highlighted uh, by the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch on their website. Uh, it, was a, it was a lady who uh, ended up with pulmonary embolism after stroke and thrombolysis uh, who didn't have any prophylaxis at all including IPC and ended up with pulmonary embolism, you know. So again, they kind of highlighted the, the learning from that. So, uh, yeah. And again, it comes down to the risk assessment and to repeat the risk assessment, particularly around bleeding as the bleeding risk diminishes, isn't it, you know. Okay, so uh, Raj, uh, my colleague, 
Hugh has mentioned that uh, VT prevention has reduced uh, litigation, but his impression is that litigation has rocketed as a consequence of uh, duty of candor. So he is not, right. not a criticism of VT prevention, just an observation that uh, the rates of litigation are high. Well, I have to say, we had at the BSH this year, actually, Wayne Thomas from Plymouth, he actually gave a talk on litigation associated with VT risk assessment and prevention, and basically all of what we should and shouldn't be doing, and how, how not to get sued, how he described it. And it was very interesting, the sort of, as long as we're doing it, and, and it seems to be the best practice, then generally we're going to be okay. If, if it's written down, it probably happened, all these kind of things. But yeah, I think you're right, this is the problem, isn't it? Duty of candor certainly had an impact, but yeah, but it wasn't a really interesting topic that's available on Catch Up if anybody wants to listen to it. Okay, okay. So, just uh, to finish off the question about anti embolism stockings, uh, we are asked uh, what about RCOG recommendations for use of anti embolism stockings? How to follow national recommendations which conflict? Any advice, Lara? I agree that's the difficulty. Um, I know the RCOG guidance is under revision now, so I hope in the updated version they may have removed those recommendations. Um, but locally, we, we're fortunate in that we have um, good discussions with our obstetric colleagues, and they were actually very supportive in not using stockings, partly because they felt women um, didn't particularly enjoy wearing them. Um, in the postpartum period and weren't particularly adherent anyway. So um, it wasn't actually, they were actually the easier group to convince that we shouldn't be using them. Um, so I think it is really just about discussing with colleagues locally and deciding what approach um, you wish to adopt. Yeah, thanks, Lara. Okay, then moving on, uh, uh, there's uh, some further questions. I think. Uh, we have drawn attention in the GERFT report that uh, omitted doses of uh, thromboprophylaxis remain a problem, contributing very significantly uh, to cases of HAT. So the question is, any measures on tackling omitted doses that we can learn or adopt? Catherine, I'm giving you all the difficult questions. Well, this was one of my questions back to you, actually, because I think this is something we are struggling with. So that was definitely on our on our list of questions around um, around missed doses and not doc no documentation of why the dose was missed or missing it for procedures that are the next day. So how do we get those messages across about what you can and can't give and when you can and can't give something or when you should and shouldn't maybe? Um, and I suppose also we use an oxaparin where you'd often go to a BD dose for patients that are over 100 kilos. So when should we be giving advice so um yeah we're working through that at the moment i would suggest um with that so i'm i'm gonna listen to uh hugh emma and lara i think on this one uh for some for some helpful advice ourselves yeah what what, what came out of uh, uh GERFT is that okay part of the the time uh this was due to healthcare professionals either knowingly or inadvertently omitting the prophylaxis, but I think uh, a major cause of this was patient refusal. So again, I think uh, it comes back to the patient awareness and education piece. So I shall ask Joe for the solution. Oh, thank you. Well, I'd really have a question rather than a solution. And what GERF did show um, as well was the the low levels of access to patient information is a routine requirement. And I, I wondered from the panel why you think there is such a challenge for many centres in this, because obviously if we want people to be um, adherent to therapy or to understand and accept, we need to find the time to both share and discuss the information with them in the way that individuals will understand. So where, where do you think the challenges are in sharing that information? And how can we help really? No, I think that's a point well made. Uh, you know, we remain bad at uh, giving patients information, probably because people are trying to do 
so many different tasks when admitting patients or pre-assessing them. So I think uh, to my mind that certainly our shortcomings in giving patient information probably in part accounts for the high patient refusals you know, amongst that omission population. So, uh, okay, Emma, uh, any? Yeah, so um, my first thoughts are that we know it's quite a difficult thing to audit and, and record and prove that patient information has or hasn't been given. So that's the first thing for us to bear in mind. It may well be that some of those patients have received either written or verbal information, but it wasn't documented anywhere that that was done and therefore not counted in the audit. However, I think um, that we have to be realistic. And like Rupin said, there are so many competing issues now and when an awful lot of paperwork as well, a lot of uh, that, that needs to be done, other risk assessments that need to be put, performed when patients get admitted. So what I always sort of um, advocate is for uh, us clinicians across the professions to use the natural opportunities to educate. So that may be when a patient comes in, when you're doing the risk assessment and needing to ask a patient about whether they've had any previous VTE, um, if we're putting on stockings, IPC, giving a dose of low mercury heparin, um, asking them about their medication history. I feel like they're all quite natural opportunities to be able to just start drip feeding that information because we know that information retention is difficult, particularly for patients who are acutely unwell. And um, therefore, I think that sort of the little and often approach by multiple um, professions is the way forward. Um, traditionally, I think we've very much relied uh, probably too heavily on leaflets. And um, I feel like it's perhaps a little bit of an old fashioned approach. Some people we know won't have the attention span when they're acutely unwell to read a leaflet. Um, some people may not have the skills to read and digest the information. And some people just couldn't care less and, and may well put it straight in the bin. Um, so we're starting to think about some more modern approaches and um, some colleagues have, have developed text messaging that they can send to patients, particularly after discharge. Other colleagues are looking at um, um, creating films and videos. One colleague um, has put together a short film so that when a patient refuses lomocrate heparin, if the ward staff don't feel able to talk to that patient about why they maybe perhaps should consider lomocrate heparin, they can give them an iPad and they can watch a short film, which will explain the reasons, which frees up the, uh, the clinician looking after that patient and perhaps goes into a little bit more detail than the clinician might have have gone into um, but but we do know patient information is challenging like i say i think it's about using um, multiple modalities and and just drip feeding that information to gradually increase the awareness amongst patients and i'm aware that thrombosis uk is uh, particularly investing in this area joe isn't it do you want to fill us in with uh, what is happening yeah, well, on, on a number of areas. So we have actually with Emma's and a, a number of, um, uh, of her colleagues' support from NNNN um, developed some what we call said cards, so little folding cards, but they are being targeted for um, individuals who have been admitted into hospital, so for um, hospital-acquired prevention, and also then for certain areas, so for um, mums-to-be or newly um, new mums, uh, just explaining in a very visual way about VTE and VTE prevention in particular, and we will be developing those further, um, looking at cancer-associated thrombosis. Oh, well done, thank you, Emma. <laughs> the little Z cards. But but I think, I mean, th there's been a number of things. We've had patients involved on these, and we've had clinicians involved as well, but also very important, there's a QR code. And I think it's a little bit, well, very much like Emma said, the drip, 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 because the QR code is take, takes you to a website page, and that is being further developed with films. One of the films that Emma mentioned there, we hope will go on there. We're developing a film as well, trying to explain and so that we can share information in many different formats. Um, I personally, or maybe thrombosis UK as well actually, would like to see a, a central um, a recommendation of materials. I, I think it's an added burden if every centre is looking to develop their own. And there's a cost factor to this as well as a time factor. And I think if working in collaboration, we can develop materials 
that others can use, whether they um, share them digitally or print them black and white or ask us or whatever, or can um, invest some money in purchasing. But I think that would also help. Um, it would standardize some of the information and it would bring in a number of different viewpoints to try and make it best possible. Uh, I think uh, your point has been also echoed in one of the uh, comments uh, that recommendation for standardized patient information rather than each organization developing their own uh, so centralized information leaflets. So uh, uh, clearly work is being done in that direction. So we did end up, uh, didn't we have a standardized patient information at the outset that was translated into a variety of languages as well? Has that fallen by the wayside? Still on the website, the vtengland.org.uk website, and, and several translations there. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that. Uh, again, I'm, I'm aware of time, so I want to uh, take up uh, some of the other questions. Uh, John Luckett, my dear old friend and esteemed uh, colleague who's done so much good work in this area. So asks uh, whether there's collection of data on VT prophylaxis in the private sector. Is VT a significant issue in this sector? Lara, do you want to comment? Because I know they contributed as well to the GERFT thrombosis survey, didn't they? Yeah. Yes, we did get some data from um, private the private sector, they weren't all invited. I think they had to express interest to take part. And most of the data they provided related to order of um, thromboprophylaxis pra practice. I think there were less than 20 um, hospital associated BT events reported um, through that system. And I think it's probably highly dependent on, because most patients when they develop BT are likely to represent back to an NHS hospital when they're acutely unwell. So it's really dependent on um, systems being in place at those hospitals to identify that it was a hospital associated event and that it occurred in the private sector and then knowing who to feed back in, the, in that private hospital. So I suspect many of the events don't get fed back just because people don't know who to write to. Um, I guess the surgery that occurs in private hospitals is probably generally lower risk and, and more day cases. So there's probably a lower inherent BT risk, risk in, in the patients that are operated on in private, you know, just because people with lots of comorbid disease will, will probably be sent to the NHS hospital rather than a private hospital. Um, yeah. So I don't think we have great um, data, but I think it's likely to still be a problem. Okay, thanks, Lara. And uh, you mentioned day cases. Uh, Aidan uh, earlier today showed that I think about 7% uh, of the VT deaths were in patients who had day surgery. And likewise, I think in the GERF data, about 6%, isn't it? Uh, but again, giving single doses of uh, low liquid heparin or putting stockings indiscriminately doesn't, uh, there's no evidence or rationale for that, isn't it? So uh, any ideas about how we can address this patient group? I think um, saying that 6% of cases occur in day cases on its own is probably doesn't really reflect how big or small the problem is, because I think so much is done as day cases now. And when you looked at the rate of hospital associated BT and day cases in GERFT, which has a lot of limitations, and I, I, you know, I don't think it necessarily accurately reflects the total rate because we probably didn't capture all the events, but it was significantly lower than patients who had had overnight stays. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was much less than one in a thousand, um, you know, compared to medical admissions where it was four in a thousand admissions. Um, so I think that's one issue. I know also in the data Aidan was talking about, they were including all medical day cases as well. So if you think about how many patients come in to have chemotherapy or dialysis, you know, that's thousands and thousands of patients. So 7% of all of those is probably not enough if you're able to work out the, 
not a lot if you're able to work out the total number of admissions. Yeah, yeah. thanks, thanks, Lara. Again, uh, what Eden uh, presented this morning, which is very much aligned with uh, what is in the GOV report, is that quite a lot of these clots occurred in medical inpatients. And uh, as I said at the time, you know, it's partly because uh, I think the thromboprophylaxis behavior in surgical patients uh, is much more well established, as well as, you know, uh, modern day surgery has changed a lot and the real risk is much smaller than it, it used to be even for uh, so-called uh, uh, high risk surgeries. So, and uh, in, in a lot of these patients uh, with HAT, we get thromboprophylaxis failure. That you know, the, the, the most common uh, group when you look at the root cause analysis seems to be uh, those with failure of cold standard prophylaxis. So how do you account for that? And what is the way past it? A very good question. I wish I knew um, exactly what the answer was. Um, I think in terms of from a prophylaxis failure, the, the rates in GERF are similar for both medical and surgical patients. And they were, I think, about 45% in, in both groups. So it is a significant issue. Um, I guess what we don't know is how to address it. And there probably needs to be further research to better understand it. We had looked at our local data, King's, quite a few years back, particularly in the medical patients. And it seemed to be more common in patients with infection and dehydration were the two issues um, that stood out. So I think we need to better, you know, better understand what the risk factor profile is for thromboprophylaxis failure. And then we really need to have well-designed studies to look at how to address it, whether it's by escalated dosing or by extended prophylaxis for very selected patient groups, because we know there's studies looking at that to date of and increased bleeding. So we need we need better bleeding risk assessment to identify who's more likely to benefit. Thanks. Thank you for that, as usual, thoughtful answer. So. Uh, uh, I, I think this uh, GERF thrombosis survey has been very important, you know, for those champions of uh, VT prevention in getting a bit better understanding of what is going on and to continue driving implementation of VT prevention. But uh, if we were successful in getting thrombosis survey part two, I'd like to just ask the panel members, you know, would you uh, want more of the same or how might you improve or alter it so that it uh, provides us with some meaningful information? You? Uh, I guess one of the questions you'd, you'd now want to ask, when was the first dose of prophylaxis given? How are we, are we meeting the NICE standards? I guess you'd also want to know um, what kind of was mechanical, was chemical, um, and, and what, what was this all appropriate, isn't it? So there's a lot of interesting data. Interesting we've got to the GERF, but one of the issues, of course, with GERF is it all kind of got towards the end. COVID came along and made some of the end of it difficult data to capture. I think whether that had an impact on the data, we don't know, but I think there is a lot more stuff out there we would like to get answered and seeing what is the absolute risk. There's, there's a lot more stuff actually we'd like to know. Catherine? Uh yeah, I think survey part two, all of the same. Yeah, I think I, I think my, um, Hugh's made some good points. I think um, just going back to what Laura was saying about from um, from the prophylaxis failures, you know, optimum dosages of uh, anti of, of low molecular heparins, you know, for, especially for patients of higher weights. Um, you know, with, there's is there more data needed on that? Is it different for the different? Is there any difference between the drugs? I suppose you know, coming from a pharmacist viewpoint on it, but you know, we've switched recently um, to a different lemon like quite heparin. I'm not sure. We we do have had more hospital associated thromboses, but it's been a funny time anyway, hasn't it? So it's difficult to know where where that's come from. But do yeah, wonder what optimum doses are, and then also around for those who where it's you don't want to give lemon like quite because of 
bleeding risk you've discussed about anti-embolism stockings and really you know maybe not not there so what what do we do on these patients especially when they're maybe you know not on the usual wards that we'd use um pneumatic compression um so you know medical patients for example if they're not on a stroke ward and things so sort of you know what what are people using when do they use these some of the different devices as well um what are people doing doing for those patients with a high bleeding risk um, and how are they assessing sort of restarting as well um, was, was some of the other things I think that would add to it. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, again, there's been a comment that shared action plan of the response to GERFTS uh, would be useful. Okay, I, I think uh, uh, these questions uh, very much uh, achieving what I wanted to do while winding up uh, in uh, getting takeaway messages from the panel. So, I and any directions of future research that you think might be meaningful as well, and any alterations to the thrombosis survey. So, in that vein, uh, coming to Emma. Thank you. I think my takeaway messages are that. Um, so much has been done over the last decade or so, and um, we've made really, really impressive inroads into reducing preventable harm from VTE to our hospitalised patients. But what GERF really highlighted was that we still have a fair bit left to do. There are still patients getting um, VTE unnecessarily in hospital. So I think um, that this the GERF survey has reinvigorated VT prevention and, and, and for that reason I do think it's important that we kind of close that, that audit cycle, um, allow people time and, and support. I like the idea about sharing action plans about, um, about implementation of the recommendations, but then the you know, GERF 2 report would help to close that um, audit cycle and give us a picture about um, how how effective I guess this national approach has been and it certainly um, created an awful lot of discussion and information which I think particularly over you know the last couple of years during COVID has died down so I think it's it's come at a really really good time um, with regards to further research um, going back to patient information, I think it'd be really interesting to look at how effective our patient information is and do some research into um, the levels of comprehension and information uh, retention and maybe even, um, you know, the ways that people interpret and, and act on the information that they're given would be really useful for us to sort of be able to adapt what we're doing and do it in a really efficient way going forwards. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Emma. Then Lara. Um, I, I agree with Emma really in terms of the takeaways. I think the two things that surprised me most about the survey were that was the low delivery of patient information and also the number of missed doses. And um, so I think they were the two key areas that we've tried to sort of tackle locally. Um, it's interesting to hear that Hugh and Catherine are both pro collecting additional data in GERF2 because I always worried that it was quite labor intensive as it was. Um, but if there's, you know, if there's scope for additional data, that's great. <laughs> um, and then in terms of research, I think uh, part of the process that's laborious is the identification of hospital associated BTE and investigating um, how many of them were potentially preventable. And I think it'd be great if we could somehow develop a national approach to, to doing that. I think we know that coding isn't the right way to identify them. Um, but there have been some studies in the States using machine learning and natural language processing in, in a couple of centers, which look quite promising. Um, and that would be where I would suggest we should be researching to see if we can adapt those sorts of approaches in England. Thanks, Lara. And Joe, uh, same question. 
Um, like Laura, I agree with Emma. I, I think going forward, the, uh, working together, so the collaboration is key um, in in bringing together. I mean, as Laura pointed out, the ideas from Catherine and Hugh of, of gathering more data, but actually just working across. If we can work in collaboration, we can improve much more easily and um, identify different gaps from different perspectives. But I think for the research area, I'd I'd also like to see um, inpatient information. Research on how patients like to receive it. So a patient focused research where they're involved. I know Simon Noble did um, a similar study in Wales, but obviously with a specific group of patients, cancer associated thrombosis patients, um, where they were given and shared information while they were waiting for treatment. So it's a very individual one to one session, but making the most of the time there and their presentation time reduced from, I think it was nine days down to three days with symptoms. So it significantly improved their outcomes. And um, I'd like to understand how together we can make this more appropriate for probably cohorts initially, because and the whole population is huge um, but I think that'll be extremely valuable so thank you okay so uh, a lot of very constructive uh, suggestions uh, I'm aware that there's uh, a couple of questions uh, that I've uh, not covered maybe I'll just allow one of them to be answered before winding up, we have a few minutes. So strategy for using loam liquid heparin and BT patients who are at risk of stroke or having previous stroke. Well, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, for those at risk of stroke in hospital. Yeah, Lara, do you want to take that? And um, sure, so I think that's probably two different questions. Yeah. Um, I guess a lot of patients in hospital are probably have stroke risk factors. I, the only one where I'd be particularly worried about perhaps giving thromboprophylaxis might be if they have uncontrolled hypertension, where you would hope that medical management would be instituted and they could then start low molecular heparin. I think for patients who have had a stroke, um, and there's concern about hemorrhagic transformation. I think uh, there's been a lot of fear of low molecular weight heparin, um, which led to the clot studies, but I think there is a role in selected patients for using it. Um, and certainly here, we have a very consultant-led um, process for deciding who should get it, where they're all reviewed. They're reviewed regularly by consultants anyway, but the BTE risk is regularly reviewed um, starting from 24 hours post thrombolysis. Um, and often they do start on low molecular weight heparin um, relatively early, although there is variation um, across our sites. Um, so I don't I think that's an, another area for research, really, because the, the research there is focused on using the intermittent pneumatic compression, but I'm sure there is a role for additional methods for some patients, particularly where they've had previous BTE. Thank you. Thanks. I, th I think we have done our best to uh, cover uh, most of the questions. I mean, we can uh, respond to the remaining ones, uh, I think, uh, uh, offline. <laughs> there's some quite, uh, there's one or two quite interesting questions that remain. Well, it uh, remains for me to thank all the participants. Uh, the attendees and of course the brilliant panel who have been handpicked because of their brilliance uh, which they have amply demonstrated uh, in the past hour. Uh, I, I hope we've been able to highlight uh, the various resources that are available whether through Thrombosis UK or the VT Exemplar Network and the National Nursing and Midwifery Network. So. Uh, uh, I can uh, signpost you to the exhibition area where these uh, resources and uh, further information is available. I mean, clearly, I think what we have done with the National VT Prevention Program in 
England has been an amazing achievement and, you know, uh, demonstrating an improved outcomes, both at a local and at a national level, which is a huge achievement. But I think uh, as uh, our local experience would vouch, as well as the GERFT survey, the challenges continue and the challenge is to both improve what we do and sustain uh, the risk assessment and uh, delivery of the appropriate th thromboprophylaxis. So please do continue all the good work. I mean, clearly there's a lot more information uh, to be shared in the course of the next few days. Tomorrow's session beginning at 10 o'clock is on quality improvement projects to improve omissions. Uh, in the delivery of low liquid heparin injections uh, for thromboprophylaxis, which as we've already highlighted, is a very, very important area that needs to be addressed. So it's uh, exactly three. So thank you all for participating and keep up the good work.